Start okay. Recording. Okay. Yeah. All fine? Okay. Yeah, please. Okay. Good evening, everybody. And thank you all for joining us. Uh, this is the first time we're using Zoom and this online presentation process. So if there are any glitches from now, I am sorry. Yeah, I hope nothing happens. Jora is our expert, so I'm sure everything will go fine. But just in case, uh, this is the first time. So be forgiving. Um, a few words about ARPA Institute. Some of you already probably know what ARPA does, and um, but some might not have heard about ARPA. ARPA Institute has been established in 1992, and we have been working in Armenia since 1992. And uh, our main objective is to provide technical and expert advice and guidance and assistance to Armenia to advance the economy, the educational system, the, the various areas of uh, expertise in Armenia. And so we provide people, experts, uh, who work with the government directly or indirectly. We organize various activities, like we have an annual invention competition for young scientists. And uh, we find experts all over the world who evaluate the inventions and, and uh, make the assessment. And we give awards to the best four monetary awards. We have uh, various activities with the universities the Academy of Sciences, various institutes of the Academy of Sciences, like the Mo Molecular Biology Institute, where we provide them, we have provided them with a lot of instrumentation and also expert advice and, and lectures and so on. And also the uh, Alihanyan Physics Institute, the uh, Ashtarak Physical Research Institute, the Chemical Physics Institute, many other institutes we have provided both instrumentation, equipment, and expert advice, and we continue to support them. Our main objective is to advance science and technology currently, and we have started just recently on a new project called the Nanotechnology Center. We're trying to establish a nanotechnology research and development center in Armenia, and the government has already uh, approved it and they are working with us and we hope that we can do it by 2021. Now this virus thing has canceled everything, I guess has brought back everything. So we'll see what happens next year. Hopefully things will get better. So that much about ARPA Institute and the only thing we do in Los Angeles is just provide lectures and presentations uh, by various experts as we have tonight. So tonight we are very happy to have with us Professor Michelle Toussaint. She's a professor in Las Vegas, Nevada, University of Las Vegas, Nevada. Uh, she, had, she has her PhD from Berkeley and she has been a fellow in Stanford. And also she has had a sponsorship from various research institutes like the uh, uh, Fulbright Association, uh, Huntington Library and many others. She has uh, received prizes and awards. She has uh, her recent book now, which, which is called The, Armenian Gen uh, the uh, British Empire and the Armenian Genocide uh, from, uh, let's see, Armenian Genocide, Humanitarian and Eternal Policies, the British, the, I'm sorry, the British Empire and the Armenian Genocide, Humanitarianism and Imperial Politics from Gladstone to Churchill. And other publications also have uh, similar, like Smyrna's Ashes, Humanitarianism, Genocide, and the Birth of the Middle, Middle East, and several others which have been uh, awarded as uh, best articles. And so I uh, present to you Professor Tucson. Well, thank you for having me. This is my first Zoom presentation. So if there's any problems, technical problems, just put it in the chat and let Jora know that that's, what, that's what's going on. Um, I'm going to give you a lecture. I'll speak for about 40, 45 minutes. 
and then um, I will answer your questions. First of all, thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you for getting up early if you're around the world. Um, and thank you for, um, for, for joining me tonight. It's a pleasure to really to talk to you about my research on the Armenian Genocide. I'm going to start, um, I'm going to share my screen and show you some slides. So I'll appear in the corner here. But I want to start with a story about Kilims. As many of you know, um, a kilim, of course, is a tapestry woven carpet produced by Ottoman Armenians in the 19th century. If you look closely, you can see a pattern. Dozens of crosses cascade from top to bottom. I'm sorry, I'm still learning my slide here. There we go. As Christian minorities living amongst a Muslim majority in the Ottoman Empire, Armenians displayed symbols of their religion carefully. They don't obviously look like religious cross, um, symbols, but we know that they are crosses. Minorities have always faced a difficult position in the Middle East, as evidenced by the destruction in Syria today. Persecution of religious minorities was not an infrequent occurrence in the Ottoman Empire, which, which, which once spanned from modern day Eastern Europe to the Arabian Peninsula to North Africa. Mostly, however, these communities lived side by side as neighbors, despite religious differences, in what was at the time a multi-confessional and multi-ethnic Ottoman Empire. In 1915, as we know, a toxic Turkish nationalism targeted at eliminating Christian minorities grew up under the cover of World War I. An estimated 1.5 million Armenian, Assyrians, and Greeks fell victim to the Armenian Genocide a product of state-sponsored terror on the part of the Ottoman Empire against a population labeled as an enemy from within. During the genocide, kilims became suitcases for those driven from their homes. Because of their similar length and size, as you can see here in this image, like a beggar sack, they would be crossed over one another and tied together with belongings piled in the middle. These two belonged to my grandmother, who was a very little girl when she and her mother fled the genocide. This image from the cover of my book offers a glimpse of how this scene looked for those who also escaped with their own kilim suitcases. Research on the Armenian Genocide has had a rebirth in recent years, and my scholarship is part of that. My work is done mainly in archives located in Europe and the United States, and it reveals new information about the global response to the massacres during and immediately after World War I. Today, I want to discuss the British Empire's role in guiding the diplomatic and humanitarian response to what the international community labeled at the time as a crime against humanity. The history of the response to the Armenian Genocide has focused primarily on the United States. My research reveals that the British Empire took the lead in the ultimately failed prosecution of the first case of crimes against humanity and played a central role in determining the international response. Britain ran the world's most powerful empire at the time and claimed the responsibility to protect minority rights in the Ottoman Empire. It controlled global imperial institutions that preceded and predated international institutions like the League of Nations and later the United Nations and International Court of Justice. Today, I realize it's hard to imagine a world made up of competing empires because we live in a world of nations. But this was what the reality was in the 19th century. This is a map of the world in 1900. In fact, at the time of the Armenian Genocide, the vast majority of people on the planet were subjects of empires centered in Europe and Asia, not citizens of nation states. Britain counted tens of millions of people around the globe as its subjects from India to Africa to North America. It wanted the world to believe, as this map from the time to declares that the British Empire was not a tyrannical bad empire, but rather it stood for, quote, as you can see in the top of this slide, freedom, fraternity, and federation. Claiming to protect Ottoman Christian minorities was one way to promote this vision of a benevolent British Empire. 
The inability of the British Empire to prosecute perpetrators of the Armenian Genocide and aid survivors has left a lasting legacy. In the shadow of this failure grew up a patchwork of international systems and institutions that have made protecting human rights a universal but largely unenforceable idea today. In this talk, I want to explain how this failure had important implications for how we understand three things, humanitarian intervention, international justice, and refugee policy. Let's start with humanitarian intervention. We are familiar with it today when natural and man-made disasters strike, but its history goes way back. The idea of humanitarian intervention began with the question of how to treat civilians in wartime. The 1856 Treaty of Paris that ended the Crimean War between Europe and the Ottoman Empire had provisions that for the first time protected religious minorities. The Russo-Turkish War in the 1870s tested these provisions. On the eve of this war, Ottoman soldiers massacred thousands of Bulgarian Christians. The British labeled it, quote, the Bulgarian atrocities, and the outcry over the slaughter created the role of humanitarian policemen for the British Empire. Former Prime Minister W.E. Gladstone led the call to bring Ottoman perpetrators to justice. He appealed to what he called the language of humanity, justice, and wisdom in his widely read 1876 pamphlet called The Bulgarian Horrors, and drew enormous crowds at public meetings Here's Gladstone speaking at a rally on Bulgaria. It's a woodcut uh, from the illustrated um, London News in um, the late 1870s. The 1878 Treaty of Berlin that ended the Russo-Turkish War gave Britain explicit charge to protect Christian minorities in the Ottoman Empire. Of the Treaty of Berlin's 66 articles, 11 articles dealt with minority civil and political rights. Article 44 applied to Jewish minorities. Article 61 of the Berlin Treaty codified Britain's leadership role regarding Christians. Ultimately, these paper threats, in the words of one historian, did little to benefit either Ottoman Christians or Ottoman Jews. The minority protection articles, however, marked a watershed moment regarding the question of whether a state had an obligation to intervene in the internal affairs of another state on humanitarian grounds. For Britain, Article 61 held particular significance. Despite its failure as a diplomatic tool to protect minorities, the Treaty of Berlin's 61st Article formalized the British Empire's responsibility for Ottoman Christians in the eyes of the international community. Some expressed skepticism about Britain's new role as humanitarian policemen. But the signing of the treaty released a wave of popular sentiment in solidarity with persecuted minorities that could not be stopped. The massacre of over 100,000 Armenians in the mid-1890s made the Armenian cause a centerpiece of British imperial policy. The London Times called the campaign a, quote, humanitarian crusade that Gladstone, pictured here, maintained would, and these are his word, words, serve civilization. Here's another image of him with the Duke of Argyle, depicted in Punch magazine, <clears throat> um, uh, with the un uniting the Bulgarian and Armenian causes. Gladstone and his supporters portrayed the Armenian cause as a secular campaign in defense of universal human values. A host of humanitarian organizations began to advocate for Britannia's defense of civilians for massacre. Though Gladstone himself believed that there existed a strong kinship between Anglicanism, the religion of the British, and Orthodox Christianity, the religion of Armenians, of many Armenians, he backed away from language that exploited religious divisions between other religions, particularly Muslims and Christians. For Gladstone, Britain's empire intended to defend minority rights, not start a religious war. Here he is again in punch with Britannia um, defending Armenians in the 1890s in this cartoon. But why would the British focus on the Armenians rather than in other oppressed peoples? Armenians represented for men like Gladstone, again pictured here, 
a symbol, a useful symbol, I would argue, of British imperial justice and might abroad. As Christians, they were co-religionists who were often sympathetically portrayed in the press. The rise of mass media in the 1890s meant that the Armenian massacres of that period stayed in the news. Coverage of this massacre was more widespread than any other massacre or um, event like this to date, even the Bulgarian one. The violence lasted for two and a half years and received sustained coverage. Here's a chart that I came up with for my book. Oops, sorry guys. On articles published in the British press um, about um, the 1890s massacres, the Hamidian massacres. The persecution of Armenians thus became a centerpiece of humanitarian politics. In September 1896, Gladstone asserted in front of thousands of supporters in his last public speech before his death that Britain and its empire had an obligation in the face of the failed response by the European powers to impose what he called our just demands in the wake of the Armenian massacres. Gladstone balanced the British Empire's obligation to its own imperial subjects with humanitarian commitments, calling Armenians, quote, our fellow Christians, while at the same time asserting that his was no crusade against Muslims, nor would it represent any altered policy of sentiment as regards our fellow Muslim subjects in India. Remember, the British controlled India during this time. Pamphlets produced after the massacres declared Armenia Britain's special responsibility, and the word responsibility is actually used at the time. Readers were asked to support our treaty obligations, as they put it. Article 61 inspired and gave legal foundation to calls for the British Empire to enforce minority protections for Christians over its Russian imperial rival, who also claimed to be the protector of Christians in Armenia. The campaign launched on behalf of Armenians asked Britons to accept responsibility for stopping what one commentator in the press called, quote, the hugest and foulest crime that had ever stained the pages of human history. Again, he's talking about the 1890s massacres. Intervention in the Armenian question would again be tested during the 1909 massacres in Adana and during the Balkan Wars of 1912-1913 influential members of the House of Commons started the British Armenia Committee to lobby for the enforcement of Article 61. In 1915, the Ottoman Empire joined Germany to fight against the Allies led by Britain, France, Russia, and later US. By this time, the British Empire was widely recognized by the international community as a legitimate, albeit ineffective, protector of Ottoman Christian minorities. World War I raised the stakes, though, making Britain the leader in investigating and prosecuting the Armenian Genocide as a crime against humanity. Let's now turn to the story of the response to how the Arme response to the Armenian Genocide shaped the idea of international justice. The most widely known account of what happened in 1915 comes from U.S. Ambassador Henry Morgenthau, but it was British statesman Viscount James Bryce who launched the first official investigations into the killings. His 733 page report called The Treatment of Armenians in the Ottoman Empire chronicled and explained the genocide. Here Bryce is pictured with the title page from the Blue Book. It was called the Blue Book just because it had a blue cover. They were informational reports. Part history, part documentary, the Blue Book offered evidence of concurrent massacres, a pattern Bryce blamed on a premeditated government policy of eliminating Armenians and other Christian minorities from the Ottoman Empire. Organized along regional lines with a map of affected districts, each of the report's 20 sections contain multiple eyewitness and secondhand reports, dispatches, news articles, and letters. This is a map from the blue book. And if you can imagine, you can actually still see some of the folds. It was, it would fold out of the book. So it was a very, it was, it was a large map that was meant to be read alongside these other, um, these other testimonials. The appendix of the blue book refuted Ottoman claims that Armenian disloyalty to the Ottoman Empire justified the killing. 149 documents and 15 appendices together made the case for, and these are the words he uses, and I think this is important, the exceedingly systematic plan behind the massacres. 
This official document commissioned by the British government published evidence that shaped how the international community later defined the crime of genocide in the 1940s. Bryce's leadership in the campaign was important. A respected former ambassador to the United States with a seat in the House of Lords, his advocacy work earned him a position on the International Court at The Hague. Before the Armenian Blue Book, he led the campaign against German atrocities in Belgium at the beginning of World War I. Bryce called German atrocity an indefensible crime against civilians during wartime. Among other things, the Belgian Blue Book, which preceded the Armenian Blue Book, provided just cause for Britain going to war with Germany. Britain was going to defend Belgium from the atrocities that the Germans were perpetrating on the Belgians. This earlier activism on behalf of the Belgians and in defense of international law gave Bryce a strong platform to continue Gladstone's campaign against massacre. The Armenian Blue Book, like the Belgian one before it, also helped justify why Britain went to war with the Ottoman Empire, ostensibly to protect Armenians and what they called at the time small nationalities. That's how they referred to um, uh, these minority, minorities in the Ottoman Empire, the small nationalities. British imperial diplomatic and military resources made the Blue Book possible. Information about Anatolia and Armenians came from records kept by the empire's network of consular and diplomatic outposts. The Blue Book's organization, by region as you can see here, familiarized readers with Armenians. This map plotted the places described in the testimonies and eyewitness accounts. Readers could locate sites described in the documents and trace the route of the Anatolian railway, pictured um, below in the legend, along with tens of thousands who were deported by foot and on tra on, uh, by train. Evidence gathering relied on British imperial networks, but it was the press and humanitarian organizations that raised money and awareness. An early response to the Armenian Genocide, therefore, resulted from a combination of official evidence gathering, media attention, and advocacy work. Church missionary organizations across Britain and the United States accepted Bryce's representation of the massacres as exceedingly systematic and a politically motivated crime. This public and private campaign represented the massacres as, to, as what today would be called state-sponsored genocide. On May 24, 1915, a European joint declaration accused Turkey of crimes against humanity and civilization. And here is a version, about four or five lines up from the bottom, you can see that phrase, humanity, crimes of Turkey against humanity and civilization. This is a telegram to the State Department, but it was um, encapsulating uh, what this joint declaration in 1915 um, uh, said. It was, in fact, the Russian foreign minister who made the initial charge. He came up with that phrase of crimes against humanity. But it was the British Empire that was in the best position to act. Eager to assert its leadership role in minority protection over its competitor, Russia, and influence over the Caucasus region, British officials and activists began using evidence in the Blue Book to make the case that the massacres of Armenian civilians indeed constituted a crime against humanity. According to the Blue Book, quote, the young Turkish ministers and their associates at Constantinople are directly and personally responsible from beginning to end for the gigantic crime that devastated the Near East in 1915, end quote. Raphael Lemkin, who coined the word genocide in the 1940s in reference to the Holocaust, used Bryce's Blue Book as a source for his own book called The Axis Rule in Occupied Europe which defined the crime of genocide for the first time. In 1948, the UN Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide codified language defining the intent to eliminate a population through systematic and premeditated killing as genocide. This definition was based on Lemkin's definition, which Lemkin first encountered in Bryce's Blue Book. The British Empire took responsibility for war crimes prosecutions after the war. The Ottoman Empire, because it had sided with Germany, who lost the war, faced allied provisions in the peace negotiations that held the Ottoman Empire responsible for crimes committed both against civilians and prisoners of war. Britain's historic claim as protector of Ottoman Ar Armenians over Russia, which was now plunged into a, its own bloody civil war, 
was strengthened by Bryce's authoritative account of the massacres. The failed British-led invasion of Gallipoli in April 1915 implicated the Allies alongside the Ottoman government in the killings that happened immediately in its wake. And this is a quote. The Armenian race in Asia Minor has been virtually destroyed. One critic blamed this on the, on the failure of the British at Gallipoli, which was a total disaster. This moral responsibility, coupled with the over one million British troops still stationed in the Ottoman Empire at the war's end, poised Britain to take the lead in the arbitration of the Armenian case. Prime Minister David Lloyd George anticipated, pictured here, anticipated um, this, this line of thinking and supported it. He considered World War I as a fight for international justice against tyranny led by the British Empire. This included the prosecution of the German Kaiser for war crimes and those responsible for the Armenian massacres. The Prime Minister called upon the British Empire to support the cause of freedom and humanity in a series of wartime speeches, much as W.E. Gladstone might have done before him. He kind of looks a little like Gladstone too. <clears throat> Lloyd George anticipated an ally allied victory, maintaining that after the war, and this is a quote from George, there must be reparations done for violations of international law and to support the common cause of freedom. In response to the Ottoman delegation at the peace conference, Lloyd George made it clear the kinds of violations he had in mind. The case against the Ottoman Empire's treatment of civilian populations during wartime centered on that government's failure to defend its well, own subjects. There well, is a great deal of proof, said George, that Ottoman, the Ottoman government took upon itself to organize and lead attacks well, of the most savage kind on a population well, that it ought to have protected. This is where this idea of humanitarian intervention becomes important. Assuming the lead to prosecute war criminals under the banner of the British Empire was problematic at best, however. Lloyd George's claims made during the war that the empire promoted freedom and justice fell flat on several fronts. In the Armenian case, the decision to pursue the prosecution of war criminals proved futile. The Allies created the War Crimes Tribunal as a new tool to try both Germans and Ottomans. The British initially wanted to try the German Kaiser for war crimes. What resulted instead was a short-lived set of legal proceedings against several minor German officials in a German court. Those convicted received short prison sentences for war crimes. The decision, decision to try Ottoman officials for crimes against humanity against the Armenians committed during wartime would fare little better. In October 1918, the British signed the armistice with the Ottoman Empire, which was supposed to end the war. It didn't. The framing of this doc document offered the first opportunity, however, to enforce the 1915 Joint Declaration, accusing the Ottoman Empire of crimes against humanity. After the signing of the armistice, the London Times confidently declared that the prosecution of, quote, those responsible for the massacres would come as a matter of course, because the Ottoman Empire feared harsher measures would be imposed by the Allies if it didn't. The Ottoman government, under British pressure, started in spring of 1919 to arrest high-profile suspects, including government ministers, governors, and military officers. The ultimate failure to fully prosecute key suspects came in part from the problem of executing human rights justice under the banner of the British Empire. After the signing of the armistice, the British Empire alone had the authority military infrastructure, and political will to launch an inquiry into the massacres. The British had laid claim to authority in the Mediterranean over the French. The idea of a high court to prosecute war crimes was first discussed early in 1919 at the peace conference, where allied jurists met to discuss violations of what they called human rights. The U.S. refused involvement. It was while serving on this committee that jurist Sir Ernest Pollock, pictured here with his big wig, wrote to Prime Minister Lloyd George of his frustration with what he saw as the inevitable delay in setting up such an international commission on war crimes. 
Pollock further expressed skepticism, <coughs> excuse me, skepticism that such an international body would work due to the complexity of the cases and the variation in the judicial standards and procedures along allied countries, across allied countries. This ultimately led Pollock to suggest that the British Empire take this role as adjudicator, citing its global stature and the superiority of English law and its, quote, single judge system. Though questions regarding jurisdiction ultimately led the Allies to reject, reject the proposed British Empire Tribunal, Britain continued to pursue war crimes prosecutions, producing dozens of dossiers on suspected war criminals. When Allied leaders met in April 1919 to discuss the tribunals, the Prime Minister echoed Pollock's concern over a proposal that the newly formed League of Nations set up its own court of justice. While supporting the idea that such a court should be created by the League of Nations, Lloyd George wanted to be sure that it demonstrated it was capable of punishing crimes that included criminal acts and, quote, general orders in violation of human rights. Ultimately, the War Crimes Tribunal did not fall under the jurisdiction of the British Empire or the League of Nations. Ottoman officials convinced the British that they were not, in the words of the Ottoman Grand Vizier, quote, inclined to diminish the guilt of the authors of this great tragedy, this Armenian tragedy. As a result, Ottoman authorities set up their own regional tribunals to try Ottoman war criminals. Following through with the maze of prosecutions of those accused of massacring Armenian civilians and mistreating British prisoners of war meant balancing a commitment to human rights with concerns over what the British Empire could and could not do in the early days of an unstable peace in 1919 when the trials started. Relying on the promises of Ottoman officials yielded few results. By the end of January, 60 men accused of war crimes were still at large and others already arrested had been released by the Ottoman government. Outraged, the British took custody of all the prisoners awaiting trial a few months later. The transfer of accused war criminals to jails on the British-run island of Malta, however, failed to move prosecutions forward. A, a reluctant Ottoman sultan who had pledged to support prosecution efforts worried now about a looming nationalist backlash mo mobilized behind the rising power of Mustafa Kemal. This coupled with the threat that Turkish nationalists posed to the, Brit uh, to, to the British Empire's supremacy in the region weakened the so-called inflexible resolve to prosecute war criminals by the British Empire. The glacial pace of the Ottoman peace settlement still four years away, it doesn't get resolved until 1923. And the drawing down of British troops in Anatolia diminished the effectiveness of moral and military posturing regarding the prosecutions. The failure of the war crimes tribunals in 1919 revealed the limits of international justice. Claims that the British Empire could successfully prosecute the Ottoman Empire for crimes against humanity gave way to what historians call real politique. The unraveling of the humanitarian ideals of an earlier Victorian age in the face of more pragmatic concerns had begun. As I argue in the book, no one represents this shift more dra dramatically than Winston Churchill. Churchill, who served in Lloyd George's war cabinet, believed that Arm Armenians were scapegoats, which provoked a vengeance in accord, accord with deliberate policy by the Turkish government, who wanted to ruthlessly clear Armenians from Asia Minor. As Churchill concluded, quote, there is no reasonable doubt that this crime against the Armenians was planned and executed for political reasons. But Churchill first wanted peace in the form of a treaty that would protect and strengthen the British Empire. With the war crimes tribunals in shambles, he negotiated an all-for-all -all prisoner exchange with the Ottoman government in hopes of reviving the flagging peace process and reversing the gains made by Mustafa Kemal, Kemal and the Turkish Nationalist Army, which was gaining steady strength in Anatolia in 1919. The British Foreign Office justified this about face. Saving the lives of British subjects required rejecting what the Foreign Office in Britain called the strict letter of the law as regards the Turkish prisoner at Malta, prisoners at Malta, end quote. In reality, the British received only a fraction of the number of prisoners promised. 
in this exchange. Britain wanted the post-war settlement in the Middle East to enhance its global stature while expanding its imperial mandate. But as Churchill and others soon came to realize during attempts to prosecute Turkey for war crimes, the British Empire had little power to legitimately enforce international law. By summer of 1919, Britain reduced its force in the region from 1 million to 320,000. Worries over Muslim public opinion in British India further weakened resolve. That previous spring, in fact, the same month that the war crimes tribunals um, started, British soldiers massacred thousands of unarmed civilians at Amritsar in India, further fueling in the Indian independence movement against Britain under Gandhi. In the end, Churchill decided that the Armenian crisis no longer served British interest in the Mediterranean and threatened its own empire in India. Britain chose to end its pursuit of war crimes against the Ottoman. Well, so far my story has been about high politics, the response to the Armenian genocide from the top. But what about those who were caught up in the disaster? Survival in the aftermath of genocide and war meant finding safe haven and appealing to the international community for help. Here, the British Empire also mattered. With its vast network of consulates and influence over the Middle East, the British along with the French determined the fate of over a million refugees forced out of the Ottoman Empire after World War I. Now let's turn to the question of how the response to the Armenian Genocide shaped refugee policy. Goodbye, Mr. Churchill. Hello, Aleppo, 1915. Migration happened all over war-torn Europe and the Middle East and resulted in the displacement of millions of people of different races, ethnicities, and religion. In the war's aftermath, the carving up of the Middle East had especially important implications for refugees fleeing genocide, as you see pictured here. Many of these refugee survivors who did not flee to Europe or the United States, which is the majority, ended up in British-mandated Iraq or French-mandated Syria. These regions had their borders drawn by World War I's allied victors as part of the Treaty of Versailles' so-called mandate system. Syria was created in part to provide a place for this no newly homeless population to settle. I'll tell a couple of stories um, that I think show how refugee policy evolved in relation to um, this, this crisis um, and talk to you a bit about the refugee camp and regional resettlement campaign. Refugee policy took shape in fits and starts after the war. Relief pro programs functioned with the approval and sometimes watchful eye of the British government who still controlled much of the region. And what I found is a truism, the Americans really provided the money through organizations like Near East Relief, but the British provided the infrastructure, the military infrastructure and the permission and the way of transporting these goods um, into the region. The refugee camp, in fact, was invented by the British as an important, if not always effective tool in the attempt at resettlement after World War I of this population. In December 1918, the British established a refugee camp 30 miles northeast of Baghdad at Bakuba. And you can see it pictured in this map all the way at the bottom on the right hand. You can see, um, um, you can see it. You don't see the camp, but you can see where we're talking about. <clears throat> Lieutenant Dudley Stafford Northcote, a Cambridge graduate from a prominent aristocratic family, ran the camp at Bakuba during its three years of existence. Northcote, along with five British soldiers, were responsible for the feeding, supervision, and security of both Armenian and Assyrian refugees who had fled the genocide. Northcote had no previous experience with relief work when he took up his post at Bakuba. As he told his mother in a letter, looking after refugees was, quote, quite a change from soldiering. By spring 1919, the camp at Bakuba housed 45,000 refugees. Northcote took his job seriously, learning Armenian and participating in the daily life and rituals of the camp, which included Armenian weddings. But he always knew that ultimately his job would be to repatriate refugees. The only question was where. Britain and France still wrangled over the details of administering Syria, Mesopotamia, Lebanon, and Palestine as mandates during this moment. 
In August 1920, Northcote got orders to start the repatriation project in the British Mandate of Mesopotamia, part of modern day Iraq. He moved refugees to a transitional camp outside of Basra called Narumar. The local population, surprisingly, did not like the idea of thousands of refugees making claims to their land. This put the refugee camp in a desperate situation. With nowhere to settle permanently, the refugees chose to stay in the camp. Private aid organizations stepped in and bought three more months for the refugees. When money finally ran out, it left the camp's inhabitants in terrible straits. In the end, the British and Iraqi governments and philanthropic organizations cobbled together enough funds to resettle Assyrian refugees in a region people at home had started to refer to as Britain's, quote, mess pot, but a Mesopotamian. The national solution for Armenians fared little better. League of Nations Refugee Commissioner Friedolf Nansen, pictured here at one of the Near East Relief's uh, feeding stations, those tables, those miles of tables, um, that you see um, sometimes in Near East Relief um, ads. He was working with President Wilson to designate Yerevan in the Caucasus as a national homeland for Armenians in 1920. So humanitarian um, aid workers were also working with this political solution. It was proposed that the nation would start as a mandate under European or possibly American control on, 11, on an 11,500 square mile piece of land. The mandate, as you of course know, never happened. And the state of Armenia after two years of independence became the Soviet Republic of Armenia in 1922 until the Soviet Union's collapse in the 1990s when Armenia gained its independence. Transporting thousands of Armenian refugees from the camp at Basra to Yerevan in these early days where no infrastructure or basic provisions existed to support such a huge influx of people proved difficult and dangerous. The situation was made even harder when the British government suddenly cut off funds to support resettlement. In 1921, Armenians willing to leave the Basra camp voluntarily were promised a small food ration. Northcote refused to send women and children out of their tents into the desert, as he put it. He successfully lobbied the government for more time and launched a public campaign on behalf of refugees. An aid organization hired Northcote to take charge and escort the refugees to Yerevan. Famine conditions in Yerevan, coupled with the overwhelming flow of refugees coming in at over a thousand persons per day, made it a harrowing experience for the new settlers who had little comfort or support after the camp closed and aid workers left. Northcote never really got over the experience. When he came back to Britain, he sold lace work made by refugees and sent the money to Yerevan. Though aid workers understood that relief must sooner or later come to an end, the continuing crisis made it hard to forget. Relief organizations continued to appeal to, quote, the philanthropy of the people of our empire to help. The end ultimately, in the end, um, the need ultimately overwhelmed anything private philanthropy could support. Something more was needed, but the British government did not step up to help in relief efforts. Instead, it began disengaging from the post-war emergency in the East. The work of private relief societies like Save the Children and others did important work, but private aid could not compensate for ineffective international refugee policy. While Britain pro provided the military and political infrastructure that allowed projects like those funded by US-based Near East Relief, which is pictured here with Nansen, and others to function, they could not fulfill the growing needs still. The American Red Cross, of course, is working at the same time here. It was during this time that Quaker Marshall Fox began working with the League of Nations and the Society of Friends to resettle refugees. Though the Quakers realized that they could not solve the crisis on their own, they continued to work on behalf of the refugees and cooperate with international and government-led schemes. Aid went towards an ambitious resettlement program intended to create self-sustaining communities of Christian minorities alongside already existing Arab settlements and towns. This is Aleppo in about 1919-1920. Fox, who headed the Friends Relief Program, advocated the planning of, law, of what he called land colonies in Syria to draw off the refugee population of the Armenian camps. Resettlement, he believed, would take pressure off the plan to send more refugees to famine-plagued Armenia. Friends, the Quakers, appealed to the League of Nations Mandate Commission and received the support of prominent British politicians. 
New settlements were located where settlers could farm and make a living, if not by practicing their trade, then by producing artisan goods for the local and European market. Schools, community centers, and churches, as you see pictured here, were part of the resettlement area. Fox felt cautiously, or perhaps naively optimistic, as the resettlement plan took shape. In 1927, he wrote to a supporter of his concerns over finding, quote, none who could or would teach mathematics. Getting refugees to learn how to assimilate in their new communities ultimately proved a much more urgent concern than math. But for Fox, the integration of Armenians hinged on creating infrastructure to create an educated and economically viable community, regardless of its connection to the surrounding populations. And you can kind of see here how separated this settlement is from the other, the other um, lands, <clears throat> the other buildings. The scheme to resettle over 100,000 what they called homeless Armenians already living in Syria in 1926 relied on international cooperation. The Quakers developed a program to create agricultural colonies and construct urban quarters. Nansen's office in Geneva oversaw the work and the French, as the mandatory power in charge of administering Syria, provided permission and funds for resettlement. Nearly half the money came from France, with the remaining money from American, British, and League of Nations funds, which donors expected eventually would be paid back by the refugees themselves. Work focused on cities with large concentrations of refugees, Aleppo, Beirut, Damascus, and Alexandretta. <clears throat> this is Beirut, about the same time. In Beirut, the Central Relief Committee purchased a large piece of land along the banks of the Beirut River. The building of 20 so-called pavilions with private funds provided shelter to 160 families. Though by no means luxurious, these whitewashed buildings had separate rooms and private gardens. The idea was to create self-sustaining settlements made up of, quote, strongly built, respectable dwellings. By the early 1930s, Fox began to worry that he would not be allowed to complete the mission. In a report to the League of Nations, he expressed concerns that the deadline set to evacuate the camps before the end of 1933 would leave 15,000 refugees without anywhere to go. Donors began asking for the return of the portion of their funds once they heard that the League planned to withdraw its support. The head of Near East Relief wrote in a confidential report in 1931 that his visit to Syria in October showed again very forcibly the lamentably inadequate provision that has so far been made for Armenians. News of the Turkish government's expulsion of over 30,000 Armenians the previous year justified these concerns. These new refugees expelled from Turkey after having their property seized found their way to Syria. Their passports were stamped with the words, not allowed to return. It's the grandchildren and great-grandchildren of some of these same people, along with the countless others who have fled Syria during the current civil war. Of the world's 21.3 million refugees, the highest number by far has come from Syria. Today, Turkey is still being paid to take back part of that population now stuck in Greece, a solution I find ironic at best and tragic at worst. But I'd like to leave you with some big picture considerations. In response, the response to the Armenian genocide mattered because it forced the world to confront genocide as a crime against humanity for the first time and internationalized the refugee problem. Solutions like trying perpetrators of war crimes, a refugee camp, and sponsored resettlement were invented at this moment to deal with the realities of world war and genocide. As policy and in practice, they proved largely ineffective in the Armenian case. It's easy to think of what is, that what is happening today in the realms of humanitarian intervention, international justice, and refugee policy in the Middle East is something new. My research shows that these failed solutions have an important history rooted in the response to the Armenian Genocide. Understanding these precedents, I think, can help us see mass displacement, genocide, and ethnic cleansing as anything but timeless events that will always will be repeated and dealt with using old assumptions and ineffective tools.
In my next project, I am mapping the movements of refugees within and around the Middle East after World War I using ArcGIS software in order to understand how people survive these conditions. Genocide is more than the event itself, or even the response to the event. It lives on as the experience of a people. That is a story that needs telling by the next generation of genocide historians. Thank you for listening and thank you for being here. Um, if you have questions, I'm happy to answer them. Thank you very much, Michelle.